A team at MIT just created a futuristic material that can literally pull water out of thin air. A sort of high-tech jelly that would work even in the world's driest deserts. No power lines, no batteries, just sunlight and this cutting-edge hydrogel doing what seems impossible, turning air into drinkable water. Two-thirds of humanity is expected to face water shortages in the next few decades. Researchers estimate the likelihood of water wars at 75% or higher within the next 50 to 100 years. So could this new wonder material finally be the breakthrough we need to solve the fresh water problem? Let's figure this out together. I'm Ricky, and this is 2 Da Vinci. This video is brought to you by Triple Ten. What the team at MIT did is they made the hydrogel into a sort of bubble wrap-like sheet that swells when it absorbs water during the night when it's cold, then releases the water vapor again when it gets hit by the scorching sun during the day, returning to its original state. So why does this matter? Well, the global water crisis is nothing new. In fact, we've talked about it in previous videos. Currently, over 2.2 billion people lack access to safe drinking water despite water covering 70% of our planet. Part of the problem is 97% of that water is salt water. Almost two thirds of the remaining 3% is locked up in glaciers and ice caps, leaving only around 1% or less for nearly 8.2 billion people. Not to mention all the animals and everything else. Now, don't get me wrong, there is still a lot of fresh water, but it's not always where it needs to be or when it needs to be. That's why two thirds of humanity is living in water stress conditions. In some places, this means daily rationing of water or mile long treks to find it. Even developed parts of the world like the US and Europe have faced severe droughts, turning fertile lands into dust bowls. The first logical solution is desalination, which lets us tap into that other 97%. So why don't we just build desalination plants everywhere, right? Well, it's not that easy. It requires a ton of energy, lots of capital investment, and for obvious reasons, it only works on the coast. Now, desalination is going to be a huge part of our future. That's why we've covered it in past episodes. We'll link below. But desalination is only going to be part of the solution. Yes, floating above us in the air we breathe is an estimated 3.4 thousand trillion gallons of fresh water in the form of vapor. That's three times the world's annual water demand of roughly 4 trillion cubic meters. So the question is, is it possible to pull drinking water directly from thin air? And yes, it is. It's a technology called atmospheric water generation or AWG. And MIT just developed and tested a way to make it work even in the driest desert conditions. Before we talk about what makes MIT's breakthrough different, let's do a quick rundown of how it works. There are two main ways of wringing water out of the air. One, cool the air until the water condenses. Two, use special water loving materials like hydrogels that soak up vapor and release it later. Now using hydrogels to collect water out of the air actually isn't new, we've talked about it in the past. But this new twist from MIT, led by Professor Shang He Zhao, uses a smarter hydrogel that might snag water even at lower relative humidities. It's a jelly-like material made from a polymer network of poly and isopropyl acrylamide. Now that is a mouthful, so let's just call it poly N, combined with lithium chloride salt. Structurally, it resembles a cross-linked polymer network. Imagine a molecular sponge filled with tunnels and cavities that can store water. What's special about this hydrogel is that it changes its water-bearing properties depending on temperature. Below 89 degrees Fahrenheit, 32 C, it remains hydrophilic, meaning it loves water and absorbs moisture from the air. Above 89 degrees Fahrenheit, it becomes hydrophobic, which means it repels water, releasing whatever was absorbed. They added a pane of glass that gets colder than the gel, causing the water to condense and drip down into a reservoir. The beauty of it? It's all completely passive. All it needs is the sun during the day and cold during the night, nothing else. No compressors, cooling coils, no electricity. Which got me thinking, if the polymer is doing all the work, then what is the lithium chloride doing in this hydrogel? It turns out it's the key to making the hydrogel more efficient at absorbing water even in bone dry desert air. Lithium chloride is a highly hygroscopic salt, so it attracts water vapor from the air. This boosts the water absorption capacity of the hydrogel. Now this is crucial because it lets the gel absorb water even in low humidity conditions below 30%. That's about as dry as air inside a heated house in winter and roughly the average relative humidity in Death Valley, California, one of the hottest and driest places in the world. Air so dry that your lips would start to chap and your skin would feel tight. I get tons of comments from viewers saying that they love learning about engineering and tech but feel stuck in jobs that don't utilize their passion. The reality is 76% of Americans report feeling burnt out at work and with advances happening so quickly, many worry that their jobs could become obsolete in the near future. 
That's why I want to tell you about our sponsor this week, Triple Ten. Triple Ten is an online boot camp platform that helps people switch careers. And I'm talking about real high-paying jobs that AI can't replace. They offer flexible learning that works around your current job. And they have an 82% job placement rate within six months. And get this, they offer a 100% money-back guarantee if you don't land a job within 10 months. Plus, their graduates earn a median salary of $70,000. No computer science degree is required, just a passion for learning. Yes, you'll need to study, but it's worth it. I know these are stressful times, but learn from the pros and start on your path to a new career today. Learn a new job starting from just $200 a month. Click the links in the description or scan this QR code for a free career consultation with Triple Ten. Their specialists will help you find the right job for you. Don't spend another day stuck in a job that you don't really love. Huge thanks to Triple Ten and you. Now back to the show. First, let's see why this could be a game changer. We've got these million and billion dollar desalination plants cranking out fresh water, which are pricey to build and power. But here's the kicker. Globally, desalination only covers around 1% of our total water need. So yeah, it's a tiny slice of the pie and an expensive one at that. That's roughly $1.40 to $7 per 100 cubic feet, which lines up pretty closely with what many of us pay for our water bills. Add to that the highly salty brine that is discharged back into our oceans during the desalination process and the problems compound. Let's compare that to the hydrogel. It doesn't need access to seawater or any other liquid water source. It taps into an invisible reservoir of water vapor floating around us all the time here on Earth. While previous hydrogels yielded a maximum of only around 0.5 grams per cycle, MIT's hydrogel can yield between 0.77 and 1.17 grams per cycle, which is a 54 to 134% increase. What makes this so incredible and different from most atmospheric water generators is that it's completely passive and powered by the sun. There are two main types of AWG technologies, active AWGs, which use external energy sources to extract water, and passive AWGs like this one. We've covered a few of them in the past in previous videos. For example, the Tsunami AWG system. These are active systems guzzling kilowatts to cool air and wring out moisture via traditional refrigeration. Outputs can be around 800 liters per day for their largest unit, but that's an 80% relative humidity air, and it uses almost six kilowatts of power to do so. In dry desert conditions, around 30% humidity, it would only produce around 100 liters per day, nowhere near enough to cover the average household demand of 300 gallons per day. Living in San Diego, I'm so curious about this that I actually tried to build my own in a previous video. We created a rig using a modified AC system to cool air and condense water. It's a great DIY project, but it only harvested four liters in four hours. Then you have the fog net systems. Think of a spider web made of a high density polypropylene catching mist. While these can catch around 20 liters per day per net, they thrive in humid areas where there's fog, which doesn't exactly describe the desert. Other technologies include metal organic frameworks or MOFs, which are like crystalline sponges that can work even in 20% humidity and can capture around 0.25 liters per day per kilogram. Not bad, but it's four times less than MIT's hydrogel. And here's how these different AWG technologies stack up against each other. While fog nets are dirt cheap, they pretty much tap out below 50% humidity. MIT's hydrogel, on the other hand, not only outperforms on yield and efficiency, even at low relative humidities, but it also avoids a nasty problem MOFs and silica gels have had in the past, salt water leaching into your water. Now, if you wanted salt water, you would just go to the ocean. At relative humidity levels of 30 to 50%, MIT's hydrogel takes around 12 to 24 hours to saturate. In more humid conditions, up to 60 to 80%, that timeline shrinks to just eight to 10 hours. But here's the kicker. Once you heat it to around 122 to 140 degrees Fahrenheit, around 50 to 60 degrees Celsius, the hydrogel dumps 100% of the water stored in just 10 to 20 minutes, and then gets ready for the next cycle. MIT's test panels yielded six liters per day per square meter at 60% humidity. Real world estimates on drier conditions put that number closer to one to three liters per square meter per day, which could realistically supply a person's minimal drinking water two to three liters per day in many parts of the world. With only three to five square meters of hydro panels required to generate 10 liters per day in 30% relative humidity is certainly suitable for places like Death Valley. And what does the water taste like? Well, the hydrogel releases pure water with nearly zero contaminants and it's undetectably low levels of salt, which make it safe for drinking. Okay, so MIT's hydrogel sounds incredible, but as always, there's gotta be a catch. 
So let's talk about the challenges and unknowns that stand in the way. Number one is gonna be cost. This is still lab scale tech, so naturally cost is a key issue. We don't have accurate prices, but since we know what it's made of, we can do some rough estimates. Lab grade polyan and lithium chloride are quite expensive, but the good news is that the industrial grade versions work just as well and are much cheaper. Industrial grade polyan costs between one to $3 per kilogram. Industrial grade lithium chloride costs between eight to $25 per kilogram. That brings the total price for the hydrogel to around $1.70 to $5.20 per kilogram on materials alone, considering 10% lithium chloride and 90% polyen. So how does that translate into water cost? Well, remember that one gram of hydrogel can yield 0.77 to 1.17 grams of water. So we'll average that to about one liter of water daily per kilogram of hydrogel. Now the next big question, and this is normally what holds technology like this up, is how many cycles can this material withstand? While MIT researchers tested the stability of this material over 30 cycles, polyen used in other applications like sensors are known to survive hundreds of cycles without degradation. One kilogram of hydrogel would produce approximately 365 liters of fresh water per year. That works out to between 47 cents and $1.42 per liter or 13 to $40 per 100 cubic feet. That's almost two to five times what we pay here in San Diego, which is one of the most expensive rates here in the country. And again, like most of these technologies, that is the issue. Let's look at how much it would cost to replace a single desalination plant with a MIT hydrogel system. The Adelaide desalination plant, for example, costs $1.2 billion US to build and cranks out 274 million liters, basically 110 Olympic pools every day. It costs another $110 million per year to keep running energy maintenance and everything else. So if we wanted to swap from that to a hydrogel plant, we'd need around 274,000 metric tons of hydrogel, costing on average almost $950 million. And before you think that's cheaper than that desalination plant, which is true, it isn't because you'd have to replace that hydrogel every single year. And that's without considering all the other capital and operational cost. Doing a simple estimation, Adelaide would cost roughly $150 million per year for a cost of $4.25 per 100 cubic feet. Hydrogel would cost almost seven times as much. So here's the bottom line. For this tech to be commercially viable, the stability of hydrogel has to increase dramatically to several years, or the price has to drop down to a few cents per kilogram, or it has to increase its yield several fold for it to be cost competitive with our current tech. Personally, I'm not sure that's possible, especially through a combination of these factors. We've seen how mass adoption and economies of scale can bring down prices to a fraction of what they used to be. I mean, look at solar. The price per kilowatt has dropped 90% in the last decade. But cost actually is only the tip of the iceberg. MIT's hydrogel releases water at 122 to 140 degrees Fahrenheit, 50 to 60 degrees Celsius. That means that that would work great in desert climates that are really hot in the summertime, but it might need external heat on cloudy days or in cooler regions. Extra heat means extra energy, which means goodbye to that passive component. Once energy enters the picture, you gotta figure out if it consumes less energy than other systems. And that opens up another can of worms. But first, there's another challenge you've probably not thought of, which is regulatory standards. No global regulatory framework currently exists for hydrogel-based water harvesters. Without such a framework, getting water certified as safe for drinking is gonna be difficult. Then there's the issue of the gel's manufacturing carbon footprint. The dark underside of the raw materials is that polyen is made from petrochemicals, whereas lithium chloride is mined as part of lithium extraction processes. Polyen isn't biodegradable either. Though it has low toxicity, disposing of it isn't easy. That means that if this technology is adopted on a large scale, we'll have a whole new challenge of dealing with it at the end of life after that 365 cycles that it can last. So what do we do with it? Do we bury it? Do we burn it? I think going forward for all new technologies, we have to consider the entire life cycle assessment. But before we write this off entirely, think about what this could mean for people who live in arid regions, especially inland, in desert regions that don't have access to fresh drinking water. Even if it lasted 365 cycles and had to be replaced, if they could get their hands on this and have fresh water, even in the most driest of conditions, this could save millions of lives. And I think that's where this would start. Until they can get this to last five or 10 years at least, 3,000 cycles, 
I don't see it being commercially viable just yet, but this is new breakthrough tech. But clearly the potential is there. It can swell up and hold more water than it weighs. It is the ultimate sponge. It's what makes hydrogel so interesting. And I'm hoping that we see continued research and investment in this sort of technology. The ultimate reality is, how do we recycle plastics? How do we make energy from renewable sources? How do we get fresh water? These are the kinds of problems that existed hundreds of years ago. Well, maybe not the plastic one. And they're gonna to continue to be at the forefront of the future. So that's why we cover these kinds of videos. And if you thought that was cool, check out this video next. And until next week, I'm Ricky Da Vinci. Thank you so much for watching.